Dave Campbell and he's not there. I'll have to tell him. Okay, Barbara, are you all ready? board met tonight in executive session. We're now ready to begin the public portion of our program. Uh, we did have some um, communications. We have had some written communications since our last meeting, which was November 15th, and I will just read them off. Uh, on the 15th, we heard from Tomoharu Nish Nishino uh, in support of both our COVID protocols and our DEI initiatives. Uh, we heard uh, twice from uh, Maggie Reed on the 16th and 17th uh, to request that the volume be turned up in board meetings and we're all going to try to speak into the microphones to make the volume better. Uh, and also um, appreciation for the board's work and patience and some concern about safety of board members, which uh, we reassured uh, Ms. Reed that um, we, we do have safety protocols. Uh, we heard from Lynn Vandestow on the 18th also in support of the DEI initiatives. So those are the written communications since our last meeting. Um, I'll go right into the president's report, which will be short because we have uh, several important things on the agenda. Uh, I first wanna recognize Jen Brewer, who as you know, has been our librarian in the public library in Glen Ridge for 11 years. Jen is leaving us to go be a regional supervisor in Tennessee where she will be training the next generation of Tennessee librarians. And that is excellent for Tennessee, but it is rather bittersweet for Glen Ridge. She has been a wonderful librarian. Uh, my late husband was on the library board that hired her and considered it his greatest achievement. And I think most people would agree that it was the library board's greatest achievement. She has been a gift to this community. She's brought us together and she's made the library into a just a living, breathing thing with something for everybody, with something going on. It seems like every hour of the day, uh, I think she will be very much missed. And then, um, as you know, this is the last meeting of, the, of 2021. Our next meeting will be January 5th, 2022. And at that time, we will um, swear in a new board member. But before we think about that, we have to think about uh, Teresa Boyle Bellucci, who has served on the board for these three years, who has been just a gift to the board. Her compassion, her attention to detail, uh, just her love of education, her commitment to Glen Ridge, there, there aren't really enough words. But Teresa, we'll miss you. Um, Occasionally, we will envy you when you're home relaxing on Monday nights. But, you know, the board, I have had the privilege of serving with so many excellent board members. And Teresa is certainly just among the most excellent. So thank you, Teresa. And we have a little something for you. And board members, would you like to add anything to, to that? Well, I think you said it very, very well, but the, the one thing that I would also point out is that nobody uh, can cheer you up uh, on this board as much as Teresa does, and, and that's gonna be missed, and I'm gonna just be sad for the rest of my time, but, um, <laughs> but no, I mean, you, you're, you've been wonderful, and, and, and you know, you've, you've put a lot into it, and you really have always cheered me up, which is great, and uh, I really appreciate that. I just wanted to say that I, I'm very lucky to at least have had a year um, of service with you, and I've learned so much, and I, I'm just really, really grateful, and thank you. Anyone else? Teresa, you're leaving me. <laughs> we came on together. We're supposed to go <laughs> off together, and you're leaving me. Um, I'm going to miss you, and, and it's been a pleasure. I agree. Um, thank you so much, Teresa, for everything that you've brought to this table and to the district and all of your hard work and, as Betsy said, your compassion for, for our students and our staff. And it, it's been a pleasure to serve with you. Thank you. And for Teresa. And 
I just want to say thank you um, to my board members, my fellow board members. This is a labor of love, I think we can say. Um, giving back to the community in, in, this, in this way is a very real uh, commitment of time. And um, you know, all know I'm a big believer in community service and trying to set a good example for our, our kids. Uh, not always easy. Um, and Dirk, I want to thank you and our administrators and our teachers and the staff um, and your team. Um, we are very lucky here in Glen Ridge for everyone's commitment and hard work. Um, and uh, sometimes it doesn't get said, but thank you all so much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, and that it concludes the president's report and now the superintendent's report. Thank you. Um, Teresa, I just want to wish you the best and thank you. Um, your sincerity throughout these three years has been uh, welcomed. Uh, we, we've had numerous phone calls and what, one of the things I really like about uh, our board format is having the committee uh, format in place and, and you get to know the individual board members through committee work and, and your um, input, feedback, um, Attention to details has been uh, appreciated um, throughout the last three years, and uh, it's tough seeing you go, but I want to wish you uh, the best. Thank you. As uh, We have several presentations tonight, uh, and I'm going to start off. Um, our first presentation will be our district audit report, and that will be done um, by one of our auditors, Kat, uh, Kathleen uh, um, Mantel from uh, Nizavachi. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for giving me a chance to talk about this year's audit. Um, it's been a very difficult year, and I don't know, um, since the pandemic and even before that, we've had issues getting information from the state that has really put a delay on our audits, and it's been very um, annoying from our point of view because we're really into moving along and getting things done as quickly as possible. So I'll run through the report of financial highlights and I know during the day Barbara had said to me there's a summary that the state requires us to put together to put out to the public and then I just go through the audit and pull out financial highlights that I think are important for all the board members to know. So it doesn't necessarily correlate but um, the information still, the message is still the same. Okay, we're better now. Um, so the first thing I do is I talk about fund balance changes over the course of the year. And, um, you know, almost two years into the pandemic, things have changed a lot. The first fiscal year that you ended, you were only affected three months by the pandemic or four. And then in 22, you were affected for a whole year. Um, I don't want to jump all over the place, but at the end, um, we made some comments or a suggestion about federal grants, which I will talk about, but a whole lot of different things throughout this last um, year and three quarters. But let's stick to the financial information. So the fund balances at the end of June of 21 were 6.7 million. You need to look at the details of those because in there is a $1.5 million capital reserve. There's surplus from the previous year and the current year that's being applied to the next budget and the next subsequent year's budget. So when you take all the, and there are open purchase orders called encumbrances. When you take all those restricted funds out, you're down to um, the unassigned fund balance, which, NJDOE um, passed a law to say that districts now, instead of having a minimum of 2% in unassigned, could go to 4%. And the law was written that way. It said a district may go to 4%. And as a public school auditor for many school districts, I said, that's kind of disruptive to doing what you're doing. It's changing the way your dynamic throughout. And so I couldn't really see the value in it, but I would have to assume that NJDOE did that because when they authorized the law, it was quite a while ago. And I think we were all still up in the air as to what was gonna happen with the pandemic. 
So what that means is in the past, the district was able to retain 2%, which was about $600,000. That goes up to 4%. It's now 1.2 million. On top of that, you also retain um, extraordinary aid and non-public transportation aid that the district receives. So what happens is those no award notices come out in May, June, July, as you're closing your books for the year, and it's recorded as a receivable, and the state allows you to utilize those funds. You can withdraw it from fund balance in the next subsequent year for any purpose that you deem fit. So with all of that, um, we're gonna have to keep a careful eye, good communication in terms of what the district's financial needs are and how um, you're going to manage that because the 4% limit is in effect for 21 and 22 and we have to assume that it won't be there for 23. So it's very instrumental when you're putting your budgets together that administration and we talk and make sure we're on the same page and make sure that the district um, employs every measure they can to put those funds where you're going to best need them. And then the middle of the first page, I just show how the $650,000 increase in surplus happens. It comes from savings and not spending every dollar that you budget. It comes from um, that extraordinary aid that I just mentioned. And then of course, every year you're budgeting fund balance to support the next year's budget. And there was a withdrawal from the capital reserve and paying out the prior year encumbrances. So net increase is 650,000. So again, at the bottom, I show you what the district anticipates in each year's budget. And the idea there, or what I've always said to you, is to keep that relatively um, consistent and so in 2021, it was 1.588 million, and you added 200,000 to that. It was probably appropriating money for um, the extraordinary aid, or it could have been shortfall of state aid. It, it was extraordinary aid for the HVAC repairs at the high school. Okay, thank you. And then you can see in 20, the 22 budget, 1.6 million and 22, 23 is 1.6 million. So it's really good to have that continuity. Next uh, bit of information that I share with you is the changes in the capital reserve account. You started with $1.4 million. There was a $550,000 deposit in June of excess funds. 450,000 was withdrawn and you end the year with 1,547,000. And then I just made a note that of that balance of 1,547, 192,000 was withdrawn in the 21-22 budget. And of course the board has the authority to um, withdraw funds during the year from the capital reserve account. It just has to be for a project that's in the long range facilities plan. In the capital project fund, that's fund 30. You have 223,000 unspent on the 2017-18 referendum. Just one open project. And then food service, this was, um, it was like the big talking point when the pandemic began, how to feed the children. And so you'll see in 20 to 21, almost all the revenue was gone. The sales are not there. So revenue was down 402,000. Expenses were down 327,000. And the district ended the year with a 4,457 shortfall, which um, you know we believe will be recovered in this year where you're operating a little differently. I think you might have some sales revenue in 21-22. But again, um, Barbara can reach out to me at any point and let me know how how the finances are going in the food service fund and I will give her advice. Then you have the after school program. Again, revenues were down 215,000. The expenses were down 203,000 and bring it back to zero at the end of the year. The last bit of financial information is just recapping what the long-term liabilities are of the school district. So serial bonds at the end of the year, 23 million. There's an annual maturity each year when the bonds are issued um, that is required. 
There are some bond premiums that are associated with those bonds and they're down to 15,000 at the end of the year, so I'm sure they're gonna be completely amortized next year. Compensated absences are the sick and vacation days that the employees have. And again, it doesn't change by a lot. There will be um, employees who have additional days or become vested, and then you have people who retire. So at the end of the year, that was 334,000. And then that pension liability is for the PERS system only, not for TPAF, because the state um, pays that on behalf of the district for TPAF. So the net pension liability over the last five years has been decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. The state division of pensions is audited by KPMG. And again, um, we are waiting forever for that information to come out. So right now we are waiting for information relative to June of 20. I mean, it's such old information that they still don't have the audit complete. Um, another piece of that is the other post-employment benefits. So most, most school districts haven't gotten their audit yet because we are all waiting for this GASB 75 or other post-employment benefit information. And I know in years gone by, we waited and waited and waited and finally said, we're not gonna wait anymore, it's time. So maybe about a week or two ago, we got word that it might be out in January and that's just unacceptable. So we have moved forward. Um, we have discussed this topic with our peer reviewers who come and review our firm for quality and um, we have documented that the amounts are not material and that we can move forward with rolling forward information from the year before. And that is how we're able to be here in December. Otherwise, we would probably be here at the end of January or maybe even February. So with that, there are no audit recommendations. And I think I have to remind you that not only is this a financial statement audit, but it's also a compliance audit with NJDOE regulations. It's also a single audit of federal and state grants if the district expends over 750,000, and you did, so you had a federal single audit and a state single audit. So it's a lot of documentation, it's a lot of questions, it's a lot of rules and procedures, and the district has come through with flying colors, no audit recommendations. And then my firm, for some reason, likes to make management suggestions. I think it's not a good word for what we're trying to do, but they're just trying to put some things in front of the Board of Education that might be um, of interest. So during the fiscal year end of 21, we implemented GASB 84. So all the fiduciary funds used to be reported in the back section of the report and they are now incorporated into the general fund and the special revenue fund. For June of 22, um, a statement on leases has come out. I'm not really sure how it's gonna impact you, but I don't think it's going to be dynamic. My, my, I don't think it's gonna be a um, big deal. And then uh, with the pandemic for the last almost two years, all the federal grants that come out. We just said that um, I know that we participate in New Jersey ASPO, we go to county meetings, and we've been trying to make sure we're on top of what the rules are in expending those funds. I know that we have tried to do programs in our office, but when we reach out to DOE, they don't know yet either. So we just said as a management suggestion, you know, we should be aware that they have um, strict contracting guidelines that are sometimes a little bit more than what New Jersey local pu public contract law dictates, and that, you know, they want certain account number structures. But I go to county meetings and I see your BA there, and so we're all finding the information as it comes and making sure that we all understand it and that you're complying with it. So it's just a heads up. And then the last comment was about sick and vacation leave. And I guess some of my partners thought it was worth putting in there because in the past year or year and a half, we've seen news items where it was pretty much in a municipality where people were being paid for unused sick and vacation time and it wasn't in accordance with law. So 
I know in Glenridge, we just said that the accumulated absences for all the employees about 330 something thousand dollars. So I really don't think you're gonna have an issue here. We just said that it might be good to reach out to the labor attorney and make sure that um, the way you're paying out your sick and vacation leave is in accordance with law. And I believe that it probably is. That's it. So okay. if anybody has any questions or if um, you have any questions that you want to get to Barbara, I'd be more than happy to answer any of them for you. Thank you. Uh, we'll start with the board members and then um, the first part of our first public comment, we'll also take questions from the public as well. Uh, I know there's, there's uh, auditing and then there's COVID auditing, yes? And COVID auditing makes everything much more complicated as it does in all other areas. Um, so I appreciate your comments and the thoroughness of the audit in difficult times. So board members, any questions? Uh, Anthony. In the event that you get the missing information from the state, will there be an addendum or an update to this report? No. So how will that be reflected? It will be incorporated next year and next year's report. And then hopefully if they ever get those audits completed on time, we'll catch up when they provide the information in a timely basis. So it is possible, I wouldn't hold my breath, but it is possible <laughs> that next year we'll have the night, the 20 update and I don't think 21 is even a possibility. We're so far behind. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Other board member questions? Okay. Um, that being the case, and I, I do think um, that people have to understand that federal aid comes with lots of strings, both reporting strings and spending spring, strings. And just an, an aside, when you refer to um, extraordinary aid, that's a category of reimbursement for special education for those who, who it's, it's called that, that's what it's for. Uh, it's money we've already spent and it's a reimbursement for some of that money. Okay. Um, we, if you, um, why don't we take questions on, any questions from the audience on the uh, audit right now so that we can let Ms. Mantel go afterwards and then we'll have uh, the rest of the mm -hmm. superintendent's report, presentations, et cetera, and then another public question period for uh, agenda items. Any questions from the audience for Ms. Mantel? The, um, Specifics are the same as for any um, question. You have uh, two minutes. Uh, identify yourself. Um, uh, identify your, your Glenridge residents and then um, give us your questions. Any questions for Ms. Mantel? Uh, yes. Thank you. Trish Akinlandi, uh, student in Glenridge Middle School. Um, question for you, Betsy. Is the audit report posted for the public to view? And my second question for Ms. Mantel, is there a um, threshold or any stipulations as to on that 4% whether it prevents us be from getting any future um, or next school year federal aid? Thank you. The audit is a public document, so um, it is available to anyone who wishes to look at it. Um, and uh, you can, I'm sorry? It will be posted tomorrow morning. Posted online tomorrow morning. Okay, and then from my point of view, no, there is no impact whatsoever of going to the 4% and whether it would have any bearing on federal funding. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? Okay. Um, Thank you, Kathy, for coming for such a thorough explanation of such complicated, uh, such a complicated year. It is. Thank you so much, and I hope you have wonderful holidays. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, back to okay. the superintendent's report. Thank you. Um, our, our next presentation, I'm pleased to have two high school students join us, and they're going to uh, present for the high school student council and give us a report on, on what the student council and some events at the high school. Um, I got the name Maggie Brown and Ava Blands, but we have three, and I hope you're not leaving your baby unattended. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. 
<laughs> Every parent right now is jealous of that. <laughs> Thank you to Mr. Phillips and the Board of Education for having us this evening. My name is Maggie Brown, the President of the High School Student Council. And I'm Ava Blands, the President of the Sophomore Class. I'm Grace Petretti, the Co-President of the Sophomore Class. We are here to give an update on the student events that have taken place this year. Glenridge High School Student Council has been busy this year resuming student activities and bringing back important traditions. In the first few weeks of school, we held one of our most important events, our club fair, to promote the dozens of student activities available at the high school. This event is always incredibly popular and is where students can engage with student leaders of all different organizations, including Girls in STEM, the Environmental Club, Community Service Club, Black Student Union, and our numerous honor societies. The Student Council worked closely with our administration and we were excited to be able to host the return of the homecoming dance. With the cooperation of our neighbors and the Glen Ridge Police Department, Student Council moved the dance outside to allow for COVID protocols and we had our biggest turnout to a Student Council dance yet. For our freshmen and sophomores, this was their first school dance and our seniors were thrilled to be able to attend one final homecoming. For the first time since 2019, all four grades were coming together as a school community. In the fall, we were also able to bring the high school together for Richard Day, where we celebrated the success of our fall seasons and the marching band. We are currently putting together another Richard Day for the winter season. Student Council is also giving back to the community through our candy gram sale. We will be selling candy canes for students to write a note to a friend and deliver them before the break. While this is a fundraiser to support student events, we will also share the proceeds with the Human Needs Food Pantry in Montclair. Thank you, and there's more to come. Thank you. Thank you. So we're gonna go from the high school all the way down to the primary level, and this time uh, Mr. Murphy's gonna present on some activities at Forest Avenue School. Sorry to make everybody turn around. Good evening, uh, board and community members. My name is Matt Murphy. I am the principal of Forest Avenue School, uh, where we house our pre-K to grade two students. Um, Mr. Phillips uh, suggested that we uh, come and bring some news out from our schools. Unfortunately, we're not at the point where we can bring our kids uh, over here uh, hopefully we can in the future though. Uh, so what I did was I put together a little presentation to tell you about a recent activity uh, that took place last Thursday and Friday at uh, Forest Avenue School. So as restrictions have lightened up a bit, we've been able to start reincorporating some of our STEAM programs. And one of our favorites is the Hour of Code, okay? I will turn it on. Okay, so what is the Hour of Code? Um, it started years ago as a one-hour introduction to computer science with the idea of demystifying coding uh, and to show that anybody of any age could learn some basics. Um, it's to broaden participation in the field of computer science and it has since become a worldwide effort to celebrate computer science starting with a one-hour coding activity um, but since has expanded to all sorts of community activities. Uh, for, for us, this has really evolved uh, over the years, at least the years w when I've been principal, um, where we started by doing just some paper pencil activities years back, uh, and then we had some high school students come and visit us to work with just our second graders, uh, and now uh, we make it a whole school-wide event uh, where all of our children uh, can participate. Uh, and we do this in collaboration with our home and school. Uh, so the committee of the home and schools, the, home and, the uh, Forest Avenue Home and School Enrichment Committee, um, this is a committee of volunteer parents uh, and our, uh, some of our Forest Avenue School staff. 
Uh, and we worked together uh, to implement workshops for every class. Uh, and they, they, we really had three goals. One was to explain the importance of and the impact of computer science in our lives. To give the children a movement-based experience to connect with the concept of coding. And to really get the children coding, just to just start them off. Uh, and one of the missions of the Hour of Code, which has really become an international celebration uh, in the month of December, uh, it's to make an effort to inspire all children to be interested in computer sciences and coding. Um, a root of that mission is the idea that uh, women and um, people of a diverse backgrounds have in many cases not um, been inspired to uh, become involved in computer sciences and coding. Uh, and the idea is to be uh, inclusive and to really uh, spread that uh, field uh, to as many people as possible. So the first part of the program um, was computers and coding in our life. Um, you can see a gentleman there. His name's Mike Elliott. Uh, Mike and Chris Elliott are parents at uh, Forest Avenue School. And they took the lead on giving these workshops, which was a really wonderful thing. And uh, we're thankful for that. And uh, there were many people involved, so I, I, I don't want to leave everyone out, so I won't give a whole list. Um, but the first part of the program was to uh, give the children a presentation on where are computers in our life. And they're everywhere. And so uh, we go through the history of computers and um, all the way up to today, where pretty much everything we're doing uh, involves computing and coding. The second part of the experience was a movement experience. Uh, so we've learned over the years that uh, at the early elementary level that the best way to have children understand concepts is to let them physically act it out, you know, different hands-on physical activities. Uh, so what we did was we set up a checkerboard um, and we had students volunteering uh, to move through the board uh, to get the robot. Um, however, the way they could get to the robot was by having their peers tell them directions uh, in coding language uh, to get them to the robot. So we have a little video uh, that Winnie's going to play for us here. No, that's not it. It's, it's uh, yeah, there we go. All right. This is, this is too easy for you guys. I'm going to have to make a trickier one for you guys. Pick it up. You got it? Oh, okay, I think that was the end. The is there a way to get back to the beginning on that one? Thank you. So you could see that the students' peers were giving instructions, uh, and then we made it more and more difficult uh, as we went along. Okay, we're back. So then the third step was to get the children coding. Um, so we utilized our Chromebooks and uh, a free website, which is scratch.com, which many of you might are, are probably familiar with. Uh, and we gave the children uh, the first level, uh, which was um, basically to make the code to have the cat eat the taco. Uh, so that's what we worked towards. Um, and uh, when the children got to that taco and the cat ate it, then um, you know the screen would tell them that they won. Uh, but the nice thing about Scratch is that it has multiple levels. Uh, so one thing that we see uh, is that once we get the kids going, that they really take off with it. Um, I remember uh, a couple of years ago, I did something similar uh, in a kindergarten class, and, and I hopped on, and I, I did the same activity that the kindergartners did. And I realized that by the end, um, many of them were more advanced than I was, uh, which is really uh, the great thing about exposing children to these kinds of activities. 
Uh, sometimes as adults, we're not sure whether we should expose them to it. Well, will they be able to do it? Will they, will they be discouraged? And sometimes we're shocked when we just let them go. They can really, you know, learn on their own and it becomes self-directed. And not only that, then they go home and they want to start practicing using Scratch uh, at home. Uh, so we have a short coding video, uh, just an example of a student's experience. So basically right now he's writing code to move his cat around the screen. The children got very into it. And there's just another photo. So this was just, our hour of code was just one of our, our STEAM activities. Um, unfortunately, we had to really scale down for, for a while there. Uh, but this year, we've had an opportunity to kind of get some of our programs back up and running. Um, earlier in the year, uh, the students did a gem mining experience uh, with a mining sluice that was built by our own parents. Um, in March, we're expecting to have a STEAM fair. It's one that we had planned uh, a while back, but we still have it ready. And the focus is on Leonardo da Vinci, who was a STEAM pioneer. Uh, Hands-on stations will integrate the principles of science, technology, engineering, art, and math. So that's gonna be a great experience for the children. Uh, our mystery science program uh, at, at the elementary level is great because uh, it traded in textbooks for hands-on activities, uh, which are uh, self-directed self in many ways. And uh, we're starting to get back to using our mobile makerspace and uh, a variety of developmentally appropriate technology, like Ozobox, Makey Makey. Um, we have all of those tools and, and we're able to use them with the children. Um, uh, it's important for me to give a special thanks to the Enrichment Committee, uh, not only ours now, but uh, our Enrichment Committees from years past because these things have all built upon uh, each other as we've moved through the years. Uh, the forest staff is always a big support. Uh, and uh, all of our volu parent volunteers, it's been exciting to slowly be able to start getting some volunteers uh, back in the building. Um, and we always have a little pitch at the end here. Forest Avenue School is lighting the love of learning. And that's, that's our goal is to incorporate these kinds of activities that makes uh, learning exciting for the children. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, it's, it's so amazing to see children so young, so engaged in coding. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Um, at this time, we're gonna ask Mr. DeWitt, who's our Director of Student Services, to present on um, the district's self-assessment of anti-bullying activities. to make sure I'm in time with you. Uh, good evening, I'm here to present for the submission of the school self-assessment data. So each school year, each school is required to evaluate its implementation of the Anti-Bullying Bill of Rights Act. The current review is for the 2020-2021 school year which goes from July 1st of 2020 through June 30th of 2021. The school assessment tool includes eight core elements that address all of the Anti-Bullying Rights Act requirements for schools. The school safety or school climate team in each school must assign a rating for each indicator, and that's based on the data that they have and the criteria that's provided by the state. The maximum grade that a school may receive is a 78, and each of the core elements have different ratings based on the number of questions that they have. Once the uh, school self-assessment is completed, it's presented at a board ed meeting, which is tonight, then it will be uploaded to the state and certified and submitted. So as you can see, there's the core elements. 
they include programs, approaches, or other initiatives, training on the Board of Education approved HIP policy and procedures, other staff instruction and training programs, curriculum and instruction on HIV and related information and skills, HIV personnel, school level HIV incident reporting procedures, investigation procedures, and HIV reporting. Each of the core elements has sub areas underneath it. Um, just for an example, core element one, which is programs, HIV programs, approaches, and other initiatives, includes areas such as the school annually established HIV programs, approaches, and initiatives, the a school will annually implement and document their HIV programs, approaches, initiatives. The school annually assesses their HIV programs, approaches, and initiatives. The school's HIV programs, approaches, or other initiatives were designed to create school-wide conditions and prevent and address HIV. The school safety climate team identifies patterns of HIV and reviewed school climate and school policies for the prevention of HIV. So each of the areas they're required to give a score of zero through three, ranging from does not meet requirements, partially meeting all requirements, or up to exceeding requirements. And they have documentation that will support all of their numbers. So each of the areas you'll see, I have listed in the first column the possible number and by each of the schools. Central Forest and Linden, the principals will often work together so they'll have similar programs or make sure that they're running things that are the same. Richmond Avenue's team will work together to look at what they're doing and the same thing with the high school. When we look at the total possible score, which is a 78, you'll see that each of the schools has ranging from 76 through 77. Um, I did take a look to see what it looked like in previous years. The scores were similar for Forest, Ridgewood, I'm sorry, Forest, Central, Linden, and Ridgewood. There was an increase on Glenridge High School, so their self-assessment looking at it, they did find one area, they made some changes, which is what they're doing, and were able to increase the score. That's all <laughs> short and sweet, not nearly as long as, uh, <laughs> or, or as exciting as Mr. Murphy's. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, a lot of slide presentations tonight. Uh, I'm going to give you a district update as soon as we get, uh, there we go. All right, so we already did uh, several presentations for you and hopefully you're getting a little insight of what's happening within our school district. Um, so our, our, my pandemic report, we have been seeing some, um, a little bit of an increase in uh, COVID-19 um, cases, especially at the high school. Um, but um, we had two uh, last week, but uh, overall this year we've uh, we've only had six COVID cases at the high school, um, a, a number that's uh, 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 minimal compared to where we were last year. Um, and I, I, I think about where we were last year, if you guys recall, after Thanksgiving, um, almost every district, including Glen Ridge, went on um, virtual learning for a two-week period. So at, at this time last year, we would be... Um, we wouldn't be here and um, the, the students would be learning virtually. We have been fortunate to uh, remain open this year. The number of uh, students attending was a full body and um, our number of cases have been minimal. So um, although we've had a little bit of an uh, uptick in numbers, it's certainly not where, what we experienced last year at this time. And we're seeing uh, just a slight increase of cases within the town. Um, the, the bigger story is, is what's happening throughout our, the state and our region. Uh, we've been at a moderate level for a, a number of months, um, but we've been watching our numbers slightly increase in our uh, region, we're the Northeast region. And um, as of Thursday, when the last Cali report was released, our region went to a high risk area. The entire state right now is at a high risk area. Um, the red indicates a very high risk, um, the orange is a high risk, and uh, the yellowish green is uh, a moderate level. So we're, we're seeing uh, a level that we haven't really seen in, uh, since April. Uh, we're barely uh, in that um, 
high risk, very high risk for case uh, rate and for our per, uh, percent CLI. Um, I'm hoping those numbers go down sooner rather than later. Um, we are approaching break and um, hopefully that won't impact us. We're always concerned though when there's a lot of traveling and fa fa uh, families getting together that that might cause um, some greater exposure. Uh, but when we do jump into that high risk area, the state rubric changes also. And so uh, when we're under moderate level um, for quarantine purposes, if you were positive with COVID, you had to um, quarantine for 10 days. If you were exposed and you were close contact, and those would only now um, be in place for unvaccinated individuals, you had to quarantine for 10 days. Um, if you got a, um, a negative COVID test three to five days late, um, during that quarantine period, you could come back at day seven. But now that we are at a high risk um, um, level, the quarantine period jumps to 14 days for someone who tests positive for COVID. And for a close contact, that quarantine period is also 14 days. And there isn't an, uh, the opportunity to, to uh, take a COVID test, the results be negative and reduce to that time period. So um, you're gonna see quarantine periods during this, um, as long as we're at the high risk level to be at 14 days for those who test positive and those who are close contacts. And I just again wanna stress close contacts are only for uh, individuals who are unvaccinated. Uh, there's been a minor uh, change in travel protocols that were released last week by the CDC and uh, adopted by the New Jersey Department of Health, and that relates to international travel. So if you are looking to travel over the break internationally, um, it's gonna be recommended that you take a, um, a PCR test before you leave, but prior to returning to the United States, you must have a negative COVID test within 24 hours of returning to the United States. Um, so that, that is the little change that's happening. Um, domestically, same um, procedures are in place. If you are traveling outside of New Jersey and outside of its bordering states for more than 24 hours and you're unvaccinated, you're gonna have to quarantine for 10 days, uh, but you can get tested for that uh, within three to five days and come back after a seven day quarantine. Um, and that's the recommendation of the Department of Health. So we're following along closely the numbers. We're mo monitoring our own numbers. Um, we, are, with uh, the five to 11 year olds now being able to vaccinate, we're collecting proof on our students who have, um, who become fully vaccinated. Um, we have over 400 students where we receive proof of being fully vaccinated within that age um, group. So we're hoping to see that number increase as more students uh, become vaccinated and hopefully uh, uh, eliminate the exposure and possible quarantines because they are vaccinated. Uh, I just want to give you some updates on our district initiatives. Uh, we'll continue to work with the DEI. Um, I was supposed to have an equity committee meeting, but unfortunately that had to be postponed. So we are meeting next week and we're going to work on prioritizing um, our, our next steps um, based on feedback from that, that committee. Uh, we are putting in place social emotional learning counselors, um, and that's part of our ARP grant. They're starting to get hired, and there's um, Ridgewood Avenue Centrals are in place. Uh, the high schools will start next week, and I know Forrest and Linda are in the process of hiring there. So we're going to see uh, more counselors available um, dealing with emotional, uh, uh, social and emotional learning. And part of that is really understanding your social. Uh, surroundings and your social groups. Um, I want to thank the Home and, uh, Home and School Association who met, um, the Executive Council met with um, representatives from the Glen Ridge Diversity Group and they just talked about um, ways that um, th they can work together on some DEI initiatives but also suggestions on um, how um, the Home and School could be more accessible to all families in town. So that was a productive conversation. And the Equity Committee did put out their uh, uh, newsletter and that's up on our webpage if you're interested. For our strategic planning, we have session number three this week um, and we'll continue to work on um, developing the mission statement, vision statements and, and um, 
goals and objectives for the district as we lay out a five-year plan. Um, we will be meeting six times altogether and, and finalizing that strategic plan, hopefully um, in early spring. And our special education audit, um, all the interviews has happened, all the data has been uh, reviewed, and we're right now in the process of writing the, the report. Um, they are hope, they're hoping to be done uh, this month. Uh, we do have a, meet, a Board of Ed meeting on January 5th, but it's really an organization me meeting that's limited to the amount of business we're having. So in the second um, board, ed, board of Education meeting in January, on the 24th, they will present the special, the, uh, special education audit. And I want to bring some upcoming events to your attention. As you know, the holidays and December break are right around the corner. Um, on Wednesday, the Mathematics Honor Society are having their inductions. Um, as I mentioned, strategic planning is happening this Friday and Saturday. High school um, drama production will be happening at the Women's Club. So. If you have some downtime, we'd love to see the high school students perform. You're welcome to attend. Uh, on the 23rd, there'll be an early dismissal, and then we go into our December break. We're back on uh, January 3rd with a Board of Ed meeting, as uh, Ms. Ginsburg uh, mentioned, that we will be swearing in newly elected members. Um, and then uh, the following week, we have our Ridgewood Avenue has their winter uh, band and chorus concert. Um, the high school will have the end of the marking period, and the week after that, uh, the high school will be having their band and chorus concert. So a lot of events are happening. The winter seasons are, are starting. You're, uh, you're getting a feel, at least with, as far as student activity, that we're at more at a normal um, school year. So um, things are looking positive in that direction, and hopefully uh, we don't have any setbacks that will interrupt those activities. Thank you. Thank you. That was a lot of information uh, to take on at once. But it is now time for the public comment period for comments or questions on agenda items. Uh, as you know, we have two public comment periods, one for agenda items only and then one for agenda or other items that affect the um, running of the schools. So the protocol is the same. If you have a question or comment, please come up to the lectern. I believe there's a sign-in sheet. Uh, tell us your name, uh, confirm your Glenridge residence. I will be timing, doing the timing on my, the stopwatch feature of my uh, phone and um, let us know what you think. Uh, does anyone have a question or comment? Is the librarian leaving an agenda item or not? Librarian? The departure of Jen Brewer, the librarian. Oh, you yes. Well, it. yes. Since yeah. I talked about it, yes, it is. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I That's fine. Just flummoxed my, temporarily. But my yes, name go is ahead, Scott please. Thomas. I live in 525 Belleville. Um, the library here is really awesome. Uh, we moved here six, seven years ago and got cards so we'd get books for ourselves and the kids. They gave us some literature and we read it. And uh, adult education, um, museum passes. Uh, canopy, Roku sticks, meetings that you actually want to go to. There was a concert <laughs> at one point. They handled COVID really well. So when you talked about her leaving, I didn't know if we were allowed to applaud, but I guess we are. So absolutely, we, we are. Just a show of That's all I have to say. Thank you. Other uh, questions or comments? Uh, hi, I'm Maggie Reed. I'm at 960 Bloomfield Avenue. Um, uh, I'm wondering if the STEAM classes are available to Central and Linden schools as well. Y yes, so uh, um, all the elementary classes, uh, schools have STEAM programs in them and um, uh, all classes were experienced them throughout the school okay. year. Awesome. Other comments? Okay. Well, you will have a second chance later in the meeting. Um, I'll put my stopwatch aside here. All right, um, this is the first and only meeting in the month of December, so we are due for committee and liaison reports. 
So we'll start at the end with uh, Mike DeLue. So the, <clears throat> the curriculum committee is meeting on Thursday, so we don't have anything to report yet. Uh, and I think our negotiations committee is meeting tomorrow afternoon, so I don't have anything to report there either. I, sorry for that report that was bereft of any kind of content. Um, so I'll be reporting on the Ridgewood Avenue Home and School meeting. The last meeting was from all the way back in November, so I'm going to be sharing a few updates that have occurred at Ridgewood since then. Um, they are going to be doing a production this year, much as they did Rasmilton last year. Legally Blonde Junior will be performed April 29th and 30th, for those of you who are interested. Um, there was a discussion about the casino night that's occurring as a fundraiser on March 4th. The holiday store is back again this year with this Wednesday as a final opportunity for students to buy gifts. And then the winter concert, as Dirk mentioned, happening uh, January 13th. But I think what's kind of special to talk about is more all of the efforts happening at the school around collecting things for others. So there's a, a drive right now for We Schools where groups of classes are collecting so socks, hats, gloves, wipes, hand and toe warmers um, for communities in Newark. There's a teddy bear drive being sponsored by RAS K Kids um, to gather teddy bears for the mountain kids who are at Mountainside Hospital. And there was just a, a new sock underwear and jacket drive sponsored by GRDIA, uh, so all good stuff. Um, the GRACE met back in November as well, and the next meeting is happening on January 12th, and that is a meeting oriented more towards the third grade to high school student parents, parents of students in those ages. That's it. Thank you. Heather. Sure, Linden Home and School also met in November. Uh, we got an update on their project from last year, which was repainting the murals on the playground, and they were able to complete the long wall. Um, and they're planning to do the shorter of the long walls um, when the weather cooperates again sometime this spring. Uh, Mr. Caravella talked about how they're thinking about um, bringing back the International Festival this year as well. They had a number of successful fundraisers. They had a book fair. They had the Mum and Crum and Harvest Fest. Uh, the social uh, part of the home and school had a parent coffee meetup. Uh, community service has done a number of things. They had a um, costume drive. They had a toiletry drive for Tony's Kitchen, and they're going to be doing a PG drive as well. Um, QCP had a goat yoga for a fundraiser, <laughs> and um, <laughs> apparently it was a lot of fun. Um, and a parent's night out. They're planning on having a magician night for the second graders this year. Uh, it is a spring fling year, and the kickoff meeting was supposed to be at the beginning of this month. Um, and, oh, they're also doing the, probably someone's going to report this before us too, they're doing the one book for three schools in January, where all three schools read the same book together. And looking ahead to next year, there will be openings for president or co-president and also for the first vice president. So if you've got kids that age, start thinking about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, Teresa. I guess Lamp Players just wanted to say a big thank you again to their ability to use RAS for their rehearsals. They're enjoying that so much. And they are preparing for a chorus line, which is going to take place February 24th to the 27th at the Montclair Studio Playhouse. Thank you. Duval. I have a little update for um, Forest Avenue School Home and School Association. Um, also want to thank Mr. Murphy for your presentation tonight. It was really great to see the pictures of the kids in the one hour coding program. So thank you for that. I know that, um, and obviously the home and school had a lot to do with that too. So um, there, the last meeting I attended was in November, like everyone else. So we have a lot, <laughs> a lot has happened between now and then. Um, also, uh, Forest Avenue has done a lot for the community. They have, around Thanksgiving, they collected 700 food items for Tony's Kitchen. Um, they've also worked with the GRDIA to collect coats for Afghan refugees, as well as the new socks and underwear for Isaiah House. And I believe that's um, all wrapped up now. Um, currently, Nurse Riley is reading uh, the Mitten Tree book to all the classes. And Forest Avenue has its own mitten tree where students are encouraged to bring in mittens and hats and gloves that will then be donated to the um, Human Needs Food Pantry as well. Um, 
let's see, uh, they're very excited now that Food Days is back as of December 1st. There will be um, three days a week that children can buy meals at school and we can also support our local restaurants through that program. It's a wonderful fun fundraiser for Forest Avenue School. Um, and the uh, discovery programs will be kicking off for um, their winter programming right after the holidays. So that registration is happening now. Um, and then a few dates on the calendar. Their next meeting is January 4th, which is gonna be a big week of meetings in this town for everyone, um, as well as getting back to school. And, um, but further out on March 19th, they're gonna do a, um, an, an 80s night fundraiser and are really encouraging people to put it on their calendar and especially um, important for new parents and new members of the community who have children at Forest Avenue School to hopefully join and attend and get to know uh, get to know their neighbors and have, have some fun, and raise some money while they're at it. So, thank you. Thanks, Anthony. There were, there was no um, ETR AA meetings, but there was, as, as you probably may have seen, lots of registration for sports. So sports is coming back on. One thing I did note that was um, different this year is um, the wrestling um, program is actually having a special workout session for kids to get exposure to wrestling, to mm. get to, to really get to understand the workout of wrestling, to try it out, just to see if they can bring in some more um, students into that that particular sport. But you know, it's good news that sports are coming back, so people can so kids can feel a little more normal and parents as well. So. Thank you, Tracy. So the um, Personnel and Policy Committee has not uh, met recently. Um, and unfortunately, I was unable to attend the Central School Home and School meeting um, in November, but Dave Campbell covered for me, so I'm sure he took notes and really enjoyed seeing what was going on there, but <laughs> I do not have that update. Um, the Educational Foundation, uh, they're currently um, doing their teacher appreciation initiative. So. Um, Families are encouraged to uh, put in uh, a donation in honor of a favorite teacher or a professional in the building, um, and that's their fundraiser. And unfortunately, I don't have the numbers from um, Fran Wong regarding the races that were held on Thanksgiving Day, but I know um, the whole community was thrilled that the Action Shelter and the Fleming races were back on um, for the, the holiday, and uh, it was exciting for everybody to, to have that normalcy and uh, and come together and do something fun that, that's been like a great tradition in town. So, uh, but in um, January, I'll have some numbers from Fran to share. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Campbell, who is also chair of finance and facilities, is not here this evening, but uh, finance has not met since we last reported out the 15th of um, November. Uh, the Glenridge Home and School Association met on the 18th of November. It was an in-person meeting in the evening to accommodate uh, working parents. As some of you know, they frequently have meetings in the morning, but they decided to change it up a little bit. And the in-person nature, we were in the LGI room in this building, and it was lovely to be back in person. Um, and Mr. Lawler gave a, quite a lengthy report saying that school is pretty much normal except for the masks. Um, that education is going on. Uh, he made a point of talking about what guidance is doing with regard to the um, psychological, social, emotional health of our students. Guidance is doing um, weekly check-in surveys with our students. Uh, They're hosting lunch groups on different topics of interest to the students. Um, things like that to just sort of take the temperature over time of our student population. Um, with regard to school security, uh, I know it's on a lot of people's minds right now. Uh, he emphasized that school security sort of changed during COVID. You know, before COVID, um, school security experts said, have one or two points of entry for your school and keep everything else locked down. Of course, during COVID, we were told to keep all our windows open. Uh, so we're slowly um, going back to our pre-COVID uh, school security protocols uh, and so parents should be aware of that. 
Uh, we have a new system uh, with regard to security. We have a new system with panic buttons to invoke lockdown procedures, uh, drills for in-building health emergencies, um, things like that. Uh, there will be spring evacuation drills. And with regard to activities, Mr. Hill was not there, but uh, Mr. Lala gave his report. Uh, sports are going to be normal or as much normal as possible. Uh, and he gave updates on the various teams. The spring show is going to be Mamma Mia, which as you know, is a very happy show. Um, the, there, were, there was some discussion about scheduling and lunch issues and he emphasized that um, we are back to the pre-pandemic schedule, but of course it's been so long since anybody's been on that schedule, it is hard to readjust. Uh, they have, and Ms. O'Donnell Pickert also gave the middle school report. They've purchased some, now, uh, some new outdoor equipment because as we've heard, students, uh, at least until the weather gets miserable, uh, spend some of the time uh, at lunch outdoors. And so they thought the equipment would help them, um, give them things to do. And they're also thinking about social events for students, for the middle school students, possibly ice skating uh, and other ways to sort of reinforce and rebuild student relationships. So that is the high school home and school report. And since we don't have any other board member down at the end as we normally do, that is all of the committee and liaison reports. So now uh, we will continue with our normal business. All of you have minutes in your packets uh, from the meeting of November 15th, exec session and uh, regular session. Does anybody have any changes to those minutes? No, I didn't see any either. Uh, that being the case, Michael, would you move the minutes? Yes, I move M1. May I have a second? Second. Second from Anthony got it first, Jocelyn, sorry. Uh, Barbara, would you call the roll? Mr. Bonnet? Aye. Ms. Boyabulici? Aye. Mr. DeLue? Aye. Ms. Gottlieb? Aye. Ms. Graham? Aye. Ms. St. Auburn? Aye. Dr. Yaris Ramos? Aye. And Ms. Ginsburg? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. We have some administrative items and I want to draw your attention to A3, which is the proposed district goals for 2021 and 2022. It may be a little bit confusing to people. We have board goals which affect what the board does. We have district goals for the district and then the superintendent always has goals um, which reflect his aspirations for the year and upon which uh, he is evaluated by the board. So I wanted to read off the board goals for 21-22. Um, continue the implementation of projects and expenditures using the ESSER ARP federal funding that we've received and assess the progress and efficacy of those projects and expenditures. Uh, second one, continue the implementation of DEI initiatives. Uh, and I should say also the communication of what is happening with that implementation. Finish the strategic plan process and begin implementation of the plan's objectives and assess the findings of the special education audit plan for and begin the implementation. So those are our district goals. Um, for 21-22, um, and we will be voting on them shortly. And now, Anthony, would you move the administrative items? Um, yes, I would move A1 through A5, which includes the amended A5. Thank you. May I have a second? Second from Tracy. Uh, board members, any questions or comments? Um, the on item number A five, you stated that the school calendar was updated um, because the teachers' convention. Was Correct on, on the twenty two twenty three calendar, we had the the NGEA teachers' convention the week prior. We had it on the third and the fourth. It's actually taking place on November tenth and eleventh, and I will send a notice out to the school community tomorrow. Any other questions before we go ahead with the uh, administrative items? Barbara, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Bonnet? Aye. Ms. Boyle Volucci? Aye. Mr. DeLue? Aye. Ms. Gottlieb? Aye. Ms. Graham? Aye. Ms. St. Auburn? Aye. Dr. Yaris Ramos? Aye. 
Ms. Ginsburg. Aye. Motion carries. All right, before you, we move the personnel items, I want to note once again that there are many of them uh, when we think about years past pre-COVID. Uh, at this time, we probably wouldn't have had that large a number of personnel items, but it reflects uh, the volatility that all districts in the state are, are um, encountering with regard to personnel. Supplies of every kind of school personnel uh, are short. And so that leads to the kind of volatility you see here tonight. Uh, so it is unfortunately right now the norm for us. Uh, we hope that as COVID ebbs, uh, things will change a little bit. And now, Tracy, would you move the personnel items? Yes, I move P1 through P12, which includes items on the addendum for P1, P2, P3, and P10. May I have a second? Second. Second from Teresa. Uh, in keeping with our rules, uh, person, items related to personnel are discussed in executive session. Um, so board members, if there is no objection, I'll ask Barbara to call the roll. Okay, Barbara. Mr. Bonnet. Aye. Ms. Boyle Volucci. Aye. Mr. DeLue. Aye. Ms. Gottlieb. Aye. Ms. Graham. Aye. Ms. St. Auburn. Aye. Dr. Yaris Ramos. Ms. Ginsburg. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, curriculum, we have one curriculum item. Michael, would you move the curriculum item? Yes, I'll move uh, C1, which is uh, approving a, uh, a uh, field trip that uh, apparently already took place last <laughs> week. So luckily it's the calculus and engineering students, so they must be able to figure out a way to That's make that work that. temporarily. But uh, I move I, C1. I'm yeah, into that. <laughs> okay, may I have a second? Second. Uh, I think Anthony got, or do you want Anthony? Okay. Uh, any questions from the board members on um, uh, time travel, engineering, career day, et cetera? Okay, Barbara, would you call the roll? Mr. Bonnet? Aye. Ms. Boyle Volucci? Aye. Mr. DeLue? Aye. Ms. Gottlieb? Aye. Ms. Graham? Aye. Ms. St. Auburn? Aye. Dr. Yaris Ramos? Aye. Ms. Ginsburg? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Uh, business items. Um, Mr. Campbell is not here to move the business items. Um, Duval, would you motion and uh, move the business items, please? I'd be happy to. Um, I'd move items B1 through B9. Okay. May I have a second? Second. Second from Anthony. Board members, any questions or comments on the business items? All right, Barbara, would you call the roll? Mr. Bonnet? Aye. Ms. Boyle Volucci? Aye. Mr. DeLue? Aye. Ms. Gottlieb? Aye. Ms. Graham? Aye. Ms. St. Auburn? Aye. Dr. Yaris Ramos? Aye. Ms. Ginsburg? Aye. Motion carries. We've come to the second public comment period for comments or questions on agenda or other items related to the running of the schools. The same rules apply. Uh, does anyone have a question or comment? Last chance. Last chance before the new year. <laughs> okay, uh, that being the case, uh, before we adjourn, I wanna wish everybody uh, a Merry Christmas if you celebrate that. Uh, blessed Kwanzaa if you celebrate and a Happy New Year for all of us. Let's hope at this time next year, we are not masked, we are not talking about COVID, we are back to talking all about education all the time. And now, may I have a motion to adjourn? Move. Motion to adjourn. Moved by Michael, may wait, I have wait, a second? Wait, wait. No, you gotta do it. I was gonna move it. Okay, okay. <laughs> Teresa moved it. <laughs> <laughs> we will correct the record. Teresa moved it, Michael seconded. I'll second it. Wonderful. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all.